the American food supply, we've come to realize, is really a disaster. I'm going to take a few minutes here to talk about some of the consequences of this diet for our health and well-being and some of the things that we should be doing from a nutritional standpoint to really have a major improvement in the health and well-being of America. I think uh, my colleagues have seen these slides quite a few times, but I thought if you, if you hadn't here, it, it is pretty useful to have a bird's eye view of what's OK. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to show these slides that have been developed by the Centers for Disease Control showing the obesity epidemic in the United States because they are, it is really striking. Uh, they, work, they started collecting data with a national survey in 1985, uh, and at that time there were just a few states that were, had a 10 to 14 percent prevalence of obesity. It, they were where I'm from, uh, Midwest. And what's happened has really been dramatic since that time. It's been this epidemic has spread across the country and really engulfed virtually every state. But what we've seen is, again, starting in that belt down the middle of the country, uh, just growing higher and higher levels, 15 to 19 percent prevalence, again, spreading over the country, uh, 20 percent prevalence uh, by 1998, uh, again, engulfing the country, uh, over 25 percent and again, uh, spreading across uh, most of the country. The whole country got bigger in 2005. I don't know what happened to the <laughs> graphics. But uh, then over 30%, uh, and again, that's uh, affecting more and more states. We, uh, the last data are, are available here. But you can see the time trend has been really dramatic. And that in adult, that's in adults. Uh, for children over this period of time, actually starting back a little bit earlier, there's been a, a three to four-fold increase in obesity, a huge uh, increase that affects, it cuts across uh, every group, every area of the country, although it's, the increase has clearly been worse in minority populations. Uh, the problem is that uh, the consequences of ob overweight and obesity are huge. I could talk for a few hours on that. That affects almost every organ of the body. Uh, and we have yet to pay the price for this huge epidemic of obesity because there really is a pipeline that starts off with gaining weight. Uh, at first, it's just a, an aesthetic problem, but uh, sometime down the road, it becomes uh, a, a health problem. And diabetes is what we see emerging first, and that's skyrocketing around the country. But uh, the worst problems are the consequences of obesity, and they don't occur the day you get diabetes either. It's right, those complications are directly related to the number of years you have diabetes. And so we've looked here in our populations at um, the duration of diabetes and risk of coronary heart disease. And you can see the first few years, well, double, triple increase. But by the time you're out at 25 years, there's about a 12-fold increase in rates of heart disease. So the problem is these children that are getting obese are going to be developing high rates of coronary heart disease even before they get to be age 40. And clearly, the impact on health, the impact on health care costs are going to be enormous what, uh, with what's coming down the road. Uh, if we look at the average rates of coronary heart disease in the US, uh, the, they still look like they're coming down. Uh, we've made tremendous progress over the last century in reducing what was the major cause of uh, death in the United States. But there are some really ominous trends occurring. Uh, that if we look at the younger adults, uh, their, that progress has stopped over the uh, recent years, and it may actually, there's some little hints that it may be going up again. So this is really worrisome uh, because these trends in the younger population uh, uh, predict what will be happening as that cohort uh, ages and becomes uh, middle-aged and older adults. And the other phenomena that we can't forget is that the average really doesn't apply to anybody. Uh, in the United States. Uh, the disparities in uh, income are also mirrored in disparities in health. So while an average life expectancy is still increasing in the United States, for the first time, there are now parts of this country, those shown in red, where life expectancy is on its way down. And that's really never happened in the United States in the data that we've been collecting. There's been steady improvement in life expectancy across the country, but we see 
uh, the educated, well-off parts of the country doing well, and I guess fittingly it's in the red states there, uh, life expectancy in 180 counties is now going downwards. Uh, really ominous finding. You can see it overlaps the obesity maps almost perfectly. Unfortunately, a lot of this, uh, some of this trend has been driven by what has turned out to be probably bad advice, and that's to avoid all fat <laughs> in the diet. Uh, clearly, multiple factors contributing to it, but there was a period when the main advice, really without any good support in uh, dietary guidance, was to avoid fat in the diet. And that was epitomized in the 1992 Food Guide Pyramid. Right up at the top, avoid all types of fats and oils, and by default, you were supposed to load up with Wonder Bread and bagels and stuff like that. Uh, turns out that was really not good advice. Uh, the food industry did follow that and loaded things up with sugar instead of fat, but probably had no uh, particular benefit, and actually the evidence is likely that it had some harm. Now, we have learned a lot over the last couple of decades about the factors that do influence our health and well-being. A lot of this comes from the large cohort studies that our group has developed since uh, the late 1970s, and we've assessed diet periodically every four years now over time in this group, so we could really track what each person is eating and then what happens to them in terms of heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and other events. So uh, we, we know a lot more about what will be beneficial and what will be harmful in terms of our dietary choice. I can't but give you a little bit of sampling in this 18 minutes that they've allowed me here. Uh, just as one example, uh, this is looking after 10 years of follow-up in the nurse's health study, and this is adjusted for smoking, physical activity, everything else. Uh, we've, we're looking at type of fat in the diet and risk of uh, heart disease, either dying of heart, heart disease or hospitalized for it. And as it turns out, the type of fat is really important. Uh, trans fat, as you can see, was by far the worst type of fat in the diet, whereas polyunsaturated fat and monounsaturated fats were actually beneficial in terms of heart disease risk. So reducing total fat really doesn't have any benefit for heart disease. Uh, it really is substituting, uh, replacing the bad fats with good fats is the way to do that. Another area that's emerged is, is very important is carbohydrate quality in our diets. And this has been ignored until fairly recently, and it's been quite contentious, but the evidence is really very clear that the quality of the carbohydrate, like the quality of, of the fat, makes a big difference. Uh, this is looking at type 2 diabetes, and we see a same pattern in all three of the large prospective studies I've described. I, and I find it helpful to look at carbohydrate quality as mainly two dimensions, one being the fiber content, particularly from grains or cereal fiber, and the other is the glycemic index or glycemic load. And you can see the combination of high glycemic load, meaning lots of refined processed starch that's absorbed rapidly, uh, and low cereal fiber is related to a 2.5-fold uh, increase in risk of type 2 diabetes. Another dimension of carbohydrate quality uh, it does appear to be having sugar in liquid form. And that's particularly problematic because when we consume it in liquid form, it does not induce satiety or satisfaction in the same way that eating solid foods does. And so it's a lot easier to overconsume it. So it's easier to overconsume huge amounts of sugar in this way. And then those, that sugar has direct adverse effects on diabetes risk as well. So we see that uh, sugar sweetened beverages is, is clearly a risk factor. Uh, here in the younger women, almost double risk of uh, type 2 diabetes. If we statistically remove the effect of overweight, then there's still about a 40% higher risk with one or more servings of sugar-sweetened beverage a day. So this uh, sugar-sweetened beverages are, I think, the first big target uh, in terms of uh, improving health as well as overweight, as I'll mention in a minute. Glycemic load is also related to higher risk of heart disease. Interestingly, if you're really lean and active, you can tolerate carbohydrate or glycemic load better, but not very many people in our population are really lean and active anymore. Weight, of course, is an important issue in itself. And there's been a lot of misinformation, a lack of good data about what factors do help us control our weight or lead to or make it harder to control our weight. Uh, this is a pretty comprehensive analysis uh, we did 
and published a few months ago. Dari Mozafarian led this analysis. And we combined the data from all three of our large studies to look at different foods in the diet and how they're related to weight gain. And we divided the follow-up time into four-year intervals. And uh, the three different colors are the three different cohorts. And what was striking, we saw virtually identical results in all three cohorts. And I think uh, going down that list of foods gives you the, the picture. The foods weighted, were related to most weight gain were potato chips, french fries, processed meats, unprocessed meats, butter, sweets and desserts, refined grains, and uh, cheese. And then foods that seem to really have a positive benefit for helping, us, helping control weight were uh, vegetables in general, nuts, whole grains, fruits, and interestingly, yogurt. Uh, beverages play a very important role. And again, as I've mentioned already, sugar-sweetened beverages, soda, uh, sports drinks, things like that, were uh, by far the worst form of beverages. And uh, fruit juices uh, also related to more weight gain. And the relatively uh, sort of neutral effect, but uh, it depends, of course, what you compare it to uh, for milk. And it's not on there, but actually coffee was related to uh, less weight gain. But uh, this is, all these numbers here are on, a, are on a per serving basis. And the problem is that many people consume many servings of sugar sweetened beverages per day. So if you look at it as a total uh, population consumption, they are by far the worst contributor to obesity and weight gain in our population. And that's been confirmed in many other studies with many other kinds of data as well. So what, uh, one factor that was, I think, interesting but also uh, realistic, that there was not a single food that was a magic bullet. I mean, there's all these diets that emphasize you know, one thing or another. And there, there is no single magic bullet for controlling weight. Uh, but there's lots of factors in our diet that each of them contributing sort of modestly. However, when you add them all up, there's a big bang there. And so we created a score for uh, dietary change uh, based essentially adding up the uh, relationship to the effects of all of the individual factors that I mentioned. So you could have a score that ranged from uh, one to five. And I looked at uh, people who had the uh, lowest score, which, the be which was the uh, worst diet uh, versus the best score. And you can see there was a very uh, large difference in weight change over a four year period. And, uh, up, and when you factor in physical activity as well, that could be as much as a six pound difference. And that's huge because uh, the real big problem weight gain during adult life is that pound a year on the average. So by the time somebody gets to 50, they've added 30 pounds. That's really about the average weight gain in the United States. And diet can make a big difference and particularly when combined with uh, physical activity. Uh, again, there's not a time to not time to go into all of the uh, various aspects of diet that we've seen contributing to major illnesses. But just to give an example here, we've looked at how much heart disease we could prevent if we package together what we've known. And of course, that would include being a non-smoker, having weight under control, uh, exercise even moderately, half an hour of uh, brisk walking per day or more. And then we have identified a series of factors in the diet, including uh, trans fat, high polyunsaturated fat, saturated fat ratio, uh, glycemic load, cereal fiber, fish twice a week or more, and getting adequate folic acid, and uh, obviously optional moderate alcohol consumption. Um, the point is, if you create a score out of that and add, uh, put this whole package together, we could see that adopting this moderate set of lifestyle factors could uh, prevent potentially uh, 82 percent of heart disease in, in this population in the United States. So huge potential for prevention of the, the most common cause of death by diet combined with physical activity and not smoking. We did a similar analysis for type 2 diabetes and there we found that it's potentially possible to avoid 92 percent of type 2 diabetes. Interestingly, though, only 4% of our population uh, fell into that low risk group, so that we have a huge way to go before we uh, essentially act on what we found to be very important. We're, we're not close to it. We've done a similar analysis for um, uh, colorectal cancer, and again, very 71% uh, uh, potentially avoided by simple diet and lifestyle factors. The problem is that we are very, very far away from the dietary pattern that would lead us in the direction of, of good health. Uh, 
this uh, is a, a list of the top 10 contributors to caloric intake in the United States. And as you can see, it's a pretty dismal uh, list of, uh, of foods. In fact, ironically, the only one there with, uh, parent, uh, with positive health benefits is beer. Uh, and that's, <laughs> that's, that, I'm afraid, says a lot. So let me stop here, and I'll look forward to uh, discussing this further. But the basic conclusion is that there is a huge potential for improving the health and well-being of people in the United States. And we're really headed in the wrong direction if we pursue the current path. Thank you.